You cannot change the past of this particular universe. What you might be able to do is go backwards into time and radically change the past. The result would be is that you would, so to speak, be knocked into another universe in which that change was the past. Yes, that's right. If you try to change the past, some physicists think you'll be knocked into a parallel universe. If that's not strange enough, time travel might allow famous discoveries to come from nowhere. Uh, information can pass around a loop in such a way where it's hard to see where the, where the information was created um, in, in the following sense. If you have uh, uh, someone, time traveler from the future, might go back, visit Einstein, give him the equations of special relativity, in the far future, someone would be able to read them. The time traveler could then bring them back and, and, and show them to Einstein. So you might ask, well, where did these equations come from? Since uh, uh, Einstein didn't think of them, he got, he got them from the time traveler. And the time traveler didn't think of them, he, he got them from reading Einstein's book. Captain Zero. Captain. That rifleman's going to try to sneak through and shoot Molly Pitcher. Time travel raises strange paradoxes. Will Captain Zero be able to travel back in time and save Molly Pitcher from the Redcoats? And by doing so, is he preserving history or is he creating it? Oh, bet you blasted Redcoats! These questions are no longer confined to the movies. Okay, science yeah. fiction Thank is fast becoming science. Rocket travel to the moon. It was ridiculed as uh, complete nonsense in an editorial in the 1920s in the New York Times. Now we know it is possible. Why do we know it? Because we have done it. It was known in the early part of this century that such a thing was technically feasible. The laws of physics permitted it. People just had to be sufficiently clever to make use of the laws of physics. So it is with his various notions of, of time travel. The laws of physics permit it, and I think we have to accept that it's possible. The aircraft carrier George Washington is one of the most sophisticated ships afloat. To find its way in the ocean, to land and launch planes, it has every conceivable high-tech navigation instrument. So what in the world are these sailors doing, still using the stars to navigate? And why is the key piece of equipment a watch? As they find their way, these sailors are part of the age-old quest for the perfect clock. We have three different stars that we've gone and figured out for to shoot, which they have in the body. For example, they shoot toe shafts. Okay. We take the star down to the horizon. The most important thing about using celestial bodies, be it the sun, the stars, the moon, or the planets, is time. Everything is related to the time. Until the 18th century, sailors had no way to figure out their longitude. The lucky ended up only a few hundred miles off course. The unlucky ones lost at sea. Then astronomers offered a solution. They compiled an almanac of star positions as they appear over Greenwich, England, any day of the year, any time of the day. A navigator on a ship could use a sextant to measure the angle of a star above the horizon. He could then compare his angle with the position at Greenwich given in the almanac. The key was having an accurate watch, for the stars are constantly moving targets. But the pendulum clocks of the day weren't very accurate, and they weren't much use on a moving ship. The race was on for the perfect clock. what watchmaker Jim Michaels calls a chronometer. There was a commission set up in England that uh, would offer a prize of 20,000 
pounds, I believe it was, to anyone who could come up with a chronometer that would meet uh, very strict standards. John Harrison was, uh, spent his whole life, he was a carpenter by trade, spent his whole life developing different uh, mechanisms that would pass this test. First, Harrison had to find a mixture of metals that wouldn't change with temperature. Then he had to perfect a new type of pendulum that wouldn't be swayed by the moving ship. He used a hairspring, like this one. Harrison spent 40 years perfecting the clock. During a final test voyage to the Caribbean, it lost only seven seconds. He eventually, after three attempts, won it. And he won the 20,000 pounds. Which translates to $12 million in today's money. But the perfect clock was worth much more than that to England. But the English used to say that the sun never set on their empire, and that was one of the main reasons, is because the chronometer allowed them to sail all over the world. That's the first time it's ticked probably in 40 years.